Hello. Welcome. Hi. Uli Kedzi to Writing and Fighting. I am, we are live on YouTube. I'm going to tweet out the link and I'll tag you. So um, you had your good friend, John Snowden. Uh, Is he on here? Well, no, he um, said everyone needs to listen. Oh, <laughs> oh that's nice. So, I'm trying to do that thing where I don't watch myself. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Julie was most notably my co-host on a podcast we never managed to watch. <laughs> such a good lead up to that and then our schedule just exploded yeah um, and which is a good thing but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well John if you're out there thank you <laughs> and I am going to add this watch live and to everyone um I will be introducing Julie and most of my students are watching also on YouTube because they are around the world so, and a lot of them, it is, uh, what time is it? Four, four in the morning, and they're in China. So. Good morning. <laughs> really? Chinese or, yeah, darn it. <laughs> Nisha, okay. I am, all right. And now I am back. Uh, yeah, no, it's been interesting. Um, so I've actually, like, we, we talk about Wiley Zhang a lot mm -hmm. because, um, you know, it's something that they, I mean, she's a national figure there. And yeah, so, um, but then we've also, you know, how um, just looking at the discourse of sports, mm -hmm. uh, it's forced me to kind of look at things because I want to bring something that's not just stay in the, my American centric <laughs> way of looking at life. But we, we talked about ping pong diplomacy oh. and um, you know really like how sports can act as this conduit mm -hmm. to change yeah. Like that yeah hi Atticus hello good to see you and there's Josh we're all gathering for class uh, at writing and fighting Josh you're sideways <laughs> you know <laughs> Is that good? Actually sideways. <laughs> there you are. Uh, am I right side up for once? You are right side up. Um, welcome, everyone. It is October 7th, 2020. Holy cow, what a freaking year. Um, and Atticus Crow right there was a student in my spring semester. So we went Atticus. full, I know there, <laughs> you know, Josh. Uh, we went through the full, you know, saga of uh you know being disrupted from campus and and everything and then seeing how mma had closed down and uh, all the sports and kind of following that journey because we're going to talk about that because i think it's interesting to see you know where are we october 2020 um you know when we had this uh disruption in march of 2020 um so Josh, can you introduce yourself and then Atticus and then I get the pleasure of introducing Julie uh, to the class. Uh, yeah, my name is Josh Rosenblatt. Um, I'm the author of Why We Fight and a uh, repeat uh, panelist here at Writing and, and Fighting. Yeah. Atticus. I'm Atticus. I'm a sophomore at American University. Uh, I'm majoring in international studies. I've been a massive MMA fan for about four years now and closer to five actually. And I, yeah, love MMA and I'm pretty much here whenever I can be. Yeah, he, um, it's amazing because he knows more about fights that were pre, predate his age <laughs> and, um, and it's an unreal. So his uh, MMA IQ is unbelievable. And I feel very honored that you're part of this collective roundtable, Atticus. All right. And then today as our special guest is Julie Kedzie. And thank you, you are coming back. Uh, you joined us for our first really big panel that we did, uh, I think it was in April. Um, and I, by the way, I hear some typing, if anyone. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Josh, um, that we did on gender, um, 
and uh, combat sports and, and MMA media and combat sports. And um, that was a really interesting panel to do because I really think we kind of got to layers that hadn't really been spoken about mm -hmm. and broke through some of those, um, talking about the old boys network and um, what it's like in the gym and some things that are, you know, not talked about mm -hmm. and, you know, and glossed over. So I got um, quite a few people who, who emailed me, in including Josh, who uh, watched it and was like found like very surprising and learned from it. And part of that was because the co-chair, Julie Kedzie, um, was able to bring this really dynamic group of journalists and, you know, authors and um, other kind of, you know, commentators. So I thank you for that. Um, we should think about doing another one, maybe. I'm down. I'm down. I'd love it. Yes. You know, bring, bring us back to, uh, to discuss. I spellbound that entire time, like, except when I was talking, because I love the sound <laughs> of my voice. But no, I mean, like, yeah, I was just like, I could listen to, yeah. to the women on the panel talk all day. It was amazing. Oh, my God. And I think that was maybe the moment that, um, was it Thug Thumbs? Was uh, Thug Thumbs? Thug Thumbs. Uh, yes, we're from our Tanisha, uh, Dr. <laughs> Singleton, who hopefully will be joining us soon. But that is um, when someone um, on social media just has to say something, you know, to prove that they're really smart at that moment. Um, so, I want to tell everyone that, you know, I had written out my biography of you because I want to make sure it's all said, but I'm just going to go because I know it. Uh, you know, one of the most like a successful, highly uh, known UFC fighters, now a commentator at Invicta FC. Uh, and, you know, not only do you make it, you know, you're a star and of higher achieving in the athletic world, you can't just stay there. You have to go into my nerd world and, <laughs> and also have, um, you know, this renowned intellect and I love you um, in your commentary and you are a writer. You went to the highest level place than any, especially writer who wants to do like serious work of nonfiction fiction, the I was writing workshop. Um, I think, you know, you think of Flannery O'Connor you think of, you know, these great minds, Harry Halley, who we were just talking about. Um, and, um, and yes, and so it is a privilege to have because you really are truly represent writing and fighting. <laughs> well, thank you. That's really lovely. Um, I feel like I don't want to be all that's undeserved, but I just really need to get some stuff published. So I need to get my butt out there and get some, get some work out there. It's been a while. It's out to like, everyone you know all of the agents uh, <laughs> i have a wonderful agent i just haven't given me <laughs> so that's, that's my own problem right, josh is trying to get to the next yeah. one, so you guys can commiserate <laughs> yeah. actually i i assigned josh's book um for my last semester and then it had to be canceled you know why we fight it was it was like it was horrible the COVID happened they were all supposed to buy it they were waiting for the paperback version to come out which i think is horrible because I would have wanted them to buy the hardback. I was, just, I was like, okay, we'll do this later on in the semester, not the order I want. And then COVID hit, nobody, everybody left campus. <laughs> nobody could go to that bookstore. It, it, yeah, it was horrible. I love that that bookstore has all these copies. Like they probably are. Sold. Yeah, go to Prairie Lights and <laughs> get a copy of that book in Iowa City. <laughs> yeah, my publisher's going to wonder about that bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Well, they were very accommodating. They were like, let's be kind to the students and give them the paperback. And I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> I feel like that course will be, be taught at some point and you will be brought back and you will use those copies or, or you know, order some again. Um, I also think Tanisha, Josh, was going to use your book in her class, right? Was she? Oh, oh, yes, she was. But that class also got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're telling me is I, I wrote a book that was going to be used throughout colleges just in time for college across the country to be canceled. <laughs> Blame COVID because, you know, it would oh, be, man. You would be in, you know, Library of Congress noted that, that like, you know, that this is part of the academia curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have to note too, Josh, that this hardback is also one of the only hard 
facts that got into a uh, Parchman prison in Mississippi. That's right. And it to our friend of writing, finding Chris Roy, who's a writer in um, who's incarcerated. And I didn't realize I was getting him a hard copy. And he said that Nancy, they never let hard copies, but you got it in. So, so Josh, you're notorious. It's Everything. great. So, so, so my book did not make it into colleges, but it is potentially being used as a weapon <laughs> at a prison. I, I think that that's great. That's wonderful. <laughs> All right. We've already brought up some interesting um, thought ways that 2020 has affected us. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I wonder, I guess for me, I want to start off. This is kind of a weird question, but what, when we first had COVID, what was your prediction on how this year would fall out? I guess in terms of MMA um, and sport, but when we first had the initial lockdowns in March. And I'll go to Julie. First, um, well, I, I mean, this is of course coming from a privileged, arrogant background. I was sure the scientists would have, we would have this under control and you know everything would work. We'd be maybe in lockdown of potentially three months tops and there'd be a vaccine. And that was not from listening to political pundits that I came to that. It was like from, you know, you know, listening to scientists and then, you know, you, you watch everything outside. You're like, oh no, no, this is not, there's no way, you know, and we weren't as close to a vaccine, of course, I originally thought, but I, I was so sure everybody would, I don't know why I was sure people would do the right thing, but you know, that, you know, sports would be delayed for a little bit, but then everything would be just right back. Yeah. And, I mean, but I was very wrong. Oh, wow. Did Invicta have a card in March or April? Let's see here. I don't know if I, you know, I'm, I'm terrible with memory. I don't, I think there was one canceled card, yes. Um, but I don't remember. It might have been for June, actually. Oh, got it. Because we had two in July. So I think, yeah, I think that there was one scheduled for either late April or early June. And then that was, that was pushed back. Yeah. Um, and we want to talk about that because I really think the way Invicta did delay until you said July mm -hmm. um, and what you guys did, it really showed how, um, um, and Julie and I were talking about how taking the precautions and making sure people were safe, you know, it may have cost you, they, you guys have no gate in terms of audience and um, other aspects, but you guys were able to do it, you know, and make sure that the safety. Um, we were talking about this because it looks like in Washington, people aren't as being as precautious. Um, but before I ask you, because if you could tell us kind of like what it was like to get Invicta going, Josh, where did what did you think this all happened when you were living back in Brooklyn? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I had any thoughts about. Any, any thoughts about when it would be over or how it would affect MMA? I don't think I thought about it in relation to MMA until the controversy started over whether the UFC was gonna come back way, way too early and, the, and everything was going on with the state of California and everything. My first thoughts in relation to fighting were very personal. I, I was, you know, I, I trained at a boxing gym and a bunch of the guys that I spar with, there were about four or five very large guys that I say all work for the sanitation department but they're very tough guys and they were all having their first fights first amateur boxing matches at an, an annex in Madison Square Garden uh March Friday March 13th and I remember watching things just it was maybe a day or two after the NBA shut down and they still hadn't canceled the fights wow. and I remember thinking to myself I told my wife I was like I I don't want to go to this fight. I'm terrified. I want to do the right thing. But if yeah. I don't show up for these five guys who I spar with all, I'm never going to hear the end of it. Like if I don't show up to their thing for COVID, they're going to razz me until the day I die of COVID. Um, but thankfully, the, at the very last moment, they canceled it so I could pretend like I was tough and prepared to go and actually do the smart thing and run away to rural New Jersey and never come back to the city. Wow. Josh, okay, well, first of all, that we have to maybe look at, dial into your um, ideas of masculinity and what, <laughs> how, that, how that actually usurps your sense of safety, but, you know. I mean, it was, it was, it was, I was right there on the, on the border, it's true. Um, and, you know, like, I mean, you're seeing it all over the place with Dana White, with Donald Trump. I mean, like, 
we'd like to think that issues of masculinity wouldn't play into things like epidemiology and pandemics, but our world is governed by male insecurity. And I would like to think I'm above that, but I almost went to a 3000 state person arena. I mean, granted it was very early on, but still I knew better, but how was I going to, how was I going to look those guys in the eyes? Wow. You know, and that's, it's, that's interesting. Um, Cause now I'm thinking about like the showmanship of uh, Donald Trump and like coming in and, you know, taking off the mask. And I really hadn't thought about how that's tied into this masculinity of strength or, you know, um, you know, especially because uh, was it maybe easier, Julie, that Invicta is an all female uh, promotion to that it didn't have this rush? You know, I don't know when, you know, when Josh, when you were speaking, what I was thinking actually more about, I mean, there's definitely elements of I know toxic masculinity is not the right thing to say, but whatever. You know, you know what I'm mean? just like this, this kind of uh, this mentality. But there's also what I was thinking about is how the intimate choices that we make day to day and the contracts we have, the social contracts we have with other human beings or boxing sparring partners or you know other people, how those they almost override our sense of safety for ourselves and the people around. Right? Like I, I remember when I first said I was going to. The, I came to Kansas, I was going to the dog park every day. I was one of the few people wearing a mask. And this was before they kind of established that outside there's gonna be less, you know, there's more. And, and I remember this, this man like laughing at me and I was just like, my family scientists, I'm wearing a mask. And he's just like, you know, cause my dogs liked walking with his dogs. And I was like, so we would kind of be side by side but I always would try to push away from him a little cause he wouldn't wear a mask. And, and just me feeling so embarrassed and so self-conscious wearing the scrap of cloth that could be, the guy was in his seventies. It could have saved his life if I had it. I, you know, I don't, that's self I mean that, but you know, it's just like, wow, like, but me feeling embarrassed. Like, yes. you know, like that's what's, but I, I get it. Like, that's what's so, that's what really tears at us. I think it's, in, and with Donald Trump, I mean, he not wearing a mask and, and this whole male presentation thing, you see that trickle down. I mean, like I, I said one time on Twitter, I was at a potential job interview and it ended up being a group, it was horrible. It wasn't a real job interview, a group job interview, but like, the, all the men in the room immediately took their masks off. I was like, I don't know what your status is. Why we're in a closed ear? What are you doing? But it's just like that, that trickle down, like this is how you show your confidence, you know? And it's, it's weird. Our mind's crazy. I, I, I totally departed the question. I'm sorry. No, I so, this is fascinating. Now I really want to uh, pivot to, to Atticus as our kind of, I hate that you're going to be a representative of young people, but we need to know, Atticus. What is the sense of, um, you know, we're talking about the MMA community, but I'm curious, are, we're, we're wondering, are young people feeling bulletproof or is it more um, segmented to your politics or we were talking maybe gender could be? I think it definitely varies on where you are, like with any age, like I'm from in Oregon, it's a small kind of rural town, but it's also a college town. And like the three biggest things there are like a Hewlett Packard like complex, a medical center, and then Oregon State University. So it's like relatively wealthy, highly educated. Everyone there is wearing a mask. My dad works in the city. It's like across the bridge, half an hour away, same exact size, same exact like demographics, but people there like maybe 40% of people are wearing masks, even though there's like a statewide mask order. It's just very, very different. And then there are, but like, it, it really depends on the person. And I think it depends on the person. I think politics does play a large role in it. I don't think I've seen, at least in my day-to-day -day life, like gender playing a huge role in it, or like at least gender explicitly playing a huge role in it. Um, but like, I know people, who have gone to parties like every weekend since they've gone off to college where in where places where like college is still in person. So I think it depends a lot on the person. I think younger people are more likely to feel safe, but I don't think, but I think it's their age second to their politics that makes them feel safe. 
it's so interesting. And yeah, no, uh, maybe we shouldn't assign gender. Um, I think we brought this up because Josh, it could have you could have had some female sparring partners who could make you feel equally embarrassed. I'm assuming. And have, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but uh, no, it's interesting to think about uh, how all of these things are filtering down into our day-to-day -day lives and, and how, you know, what, what this means about like MMA. So Julie, can you take us through, because you've actually been in, inside a promotion and like the decisions to decide to come back together um, and what the protocols were and, um, you know, like you guys are in Fight Church, which ever, I love Fight Church. It's just, uh, you know, um, I love when um, Tommy Joe Hold is like, you know, forget about Fight Island, you know, that's what I want. Um, you know, do, do, that's a different place than you have been. Was that part of this whole aspect of, of COVID? Um, I, I believe it had something to do with that. Yeah, it's a smaller venue, smaller building. Um, we are, the Police Athletic League in Kansas City, Kansas is where Fight Church is. It's a, a, a church, I think a Catholic church, beautiful building that was uh, turned over to the Police Athletic League. So it's a boxing gym now. And um, they always let us do our weigh-ins there so we could have public weigh-ins. So it seemed like the perfect venue in that we don't have to have an audience in there. You know, we just have to get get the cage going, get the, the athletes in there and stay, spa stay spaced apart. Um, but, you know, when we did our first show, I'm no longer the matchmaker, so I'm no longer in the know, so to speak. But Shannon Knapp and I have remained very good friends. And, um, of course, my sister is a scientist, not an epidemiologist, but she does, you know, she does kind of have a handle on or pretty good ideas about medicine and just kind of how this will work. And she's tapped into a lot of good communities. And um, so Shannon Knapp called me and, you know, she said, you know, this, we're laying out our plans for this. What's interesting about it before our first show is like the UFC was the first to come back. And I'm sure we'll discuss that later. And they, I was critical of them because I was scared. Everybody was scared. Well, you were an idiot if you weren't scared, but there was so much that could go wrong. And they, I think that they actually put some incredible protocols into place. But the fact that, and I know I've seen this said before, like the fact that Dana White went so hardcore saying all the media was trying to destroy him and he negated his own tremendous work there. Like that's what, it blows my mind. Like instead of actually giving this avenue to talk about, you did some really great stuff. And I was scared the first time, especially, was it Jacare's cornerman? Yeah, Jacare yeah. tested positive. Jacare tested positive as cornerman. Dude, I was arguing with, I think Alex Davis from ATT on, on Twitter. Like, and I was like, you know, like this has to change. This has to be better. And they made it better. And I was like, that's amazing. And, you know, Fight Island, all these other things, like not <laughs> economic, historical politics, blah, blah, blah aside. This was one of the safest and, and best ways I think to do things. And, you know, when people tested positive, they were rushing into action. I have a feeling there were more positive tests um, from fighters and possibly employees. I don't know, but whatever they did, they did a really good job of making sure people stayed safe. And it was just like, why are you going after the people asking these questions when you could be promoting the hell out of yourself? What is wrong with you? But, that aside, like I don't, I don't understand attacking the people asking the right questions. You should want the right questions asked so that you can address them. Like that's how you get better. Anyway, all of that aside, Shannon paid very close attention to what they were doing. She paid close attention, I think, to the NBA, um, to all these other sports leagues that were, you know, you know, we can't do a full bubble or anything like that. But uh, the first show protocols are tremendous and they've continued to this day. You get to the hotel, the fight hotel, um, you get temperature checks, you get at, le at least two COVID uh, tests. As far as I know, one COVID test when you get there and nobody's allowed to interact with each other until after that. And Cutman Mike, who's amazing, hazmat suit comes in, takes your temperature every day, twice a day, um, you know, it keeps you like stays in touch with everybody. I remember I couldn't make it to the weigh-ins one time. Um, and so he live streamed them for me, like, or he just videotaped them for me. Cause I, I like to see the weigh-ins. I like to see the fighters' mentalities, what they're trying to hide. Like you can learn a lot from weigh-ins, especially the not presentation weigh-ins, but the ones that when they're really on weigh -in. And so, you know, he was, I mean, they went out of the way to make sure people were taken care of. I'm pretty sure they're providing food for the fighters. Um, 
they're, they're doing so much and it's, it's working. When there are positive tests, they immediately go back and they double test. They do all these things, but they pull them off the card. You know, if there's a corner man who tests, if there's a, a, a corner person who tests, excuse me, or a fighter who tests positive, pull them off the card. They go through, you know, as much as they can. And it, I, we had a couple scares, but we have it, what it made Shannon do was double down on testing protocols, double down on safety protocols, and it's working. Yeah. I, okay, first of all, news alert, everyone. Julie Kensey said Dana White did a good job <laughs> and, and, event, and making them better. And what I want to tell you, Julie, is that by having journalists and having people like you questioning, you know, I think the problem with Jacare is that he had tested positive and they let him walk around or, or he had not had the results back. Mm -hmm. And so by having that pressure there, it didn't happen again. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but everyone should know that. And I think you're right. Looking at the UC, like one of the main themes from this talk is that they are done very well. And mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, I'm gonna show you guys that uh, 42 was the magic number. I think you guys remember that, that that is their ESPN contract, uh, that they get 750 million. This is from Trent, um, Ryan Smith and Forbes. He, he like maybe, and made sure and sourced that, that that was something that they were the goal. And it's funny because I looked and I, um, I'll share my screen really quickly. I was, I was talking to Julie early and I like, I actually went and individually counted all, there you are, Julie. <laughs> you see how great I am on my Zoom here. Um, but, uh, and I'll do this for you. Oh, well, you guys can see. So they've had 30 events. In April, they only had seven. And so people were like, wow, how are they ever going to do it? But as you've seen, we had a few double decker. Uh, weeks where we had a Wednesday card and a Friday card. We have had a card every week. And Josh and I have talked about how we've had a little bit of fatigue because it's either Fight Island and Atticus, either Fight Island or a lot of it's Vegas. And I'm like, what are we, Vegas 20, 32? And, you know, it's getting, I just kind of, I, I realized when they would travel, at least I had other things to look at. I guess. Um, so they've had 30 and they have 11 planned. And I'm like, wow. So right now, as it stands, we have 41 events. And I, I was saying, Julie, like, there's got to be a way that he gets another one in there. Oh, I just can't see. <laughs> that. It's kind of random Tuesday night yeah. fight happening or something. Yeah. Here, I'll stop my share. Um, because there's another thing I wanted to ask you when you were talking there is, things, the protocols that we put in place that have allowed this success, that have allowed us to have all these fights. Um, and the USC is doing much better than expected on uh, ESPN where other sports are stagnant mm -hmm. and not. And we could maybe talk about that, that why um, interest in sports, baseball has been very low and maybe it's because big teams aren't in and it's been such a short, you know, um, you know, kind of segmented season, uh, but they're doing very well in the ratings. Uh, I hope we keep some of these protocols. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, oh, we've got someone coming. Um, do you think that like, they'll keep these protocols of get feeding the fighters and, you know, because are we having, did you, are we possibly having better weight cuts? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I think because the problem is with weight cuts, yeah, yeah. fighters, they cut weight. So I mean, it would be great to think that, um, but you know, I, I, I couldn't give you offhand the percentage. It's something I should pay more attention to the percentage of weight misses and stuff. Yeah. Um, when I was matchmaking, I was much more in tune with that. Now I'm just like, I could be compassionate again. So I was like, then I'm like, just make weight. I don't care. Just make weight. And you know, now I'm like, I'm like, oh, I feel bad. Yeah. Um, but the um the I would say I don't know if there's been a significant um decrease in weight misses. I think that's something that I, I'd love to see numbers on that. I hope somebody's published something on that. What um 
because fighters cut weight so differently they you know getting to saunas and stuff like that they can't leave their room so it almost always has to be i think bathtub or 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 shower sauna like self-made sauna that kind of thing so i think there are definitely fighters who struggle with their like, i want to run around the parking lot or i want to run i want to go to the you know it's just like and you can't do that so as far as invicta is concerned i don't the last card seemed i think we had one miss um and it wasn't like from that far off but yeah, I think fighters have done well with it, but it's really too soon to tell. So it's only been three cards, so. No. Um, well, and then we're gonna go into why you think that the UFC and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I love an Invicta card, so they're a success. And, you know, you guys are on Fight Path, so do you even have ratings? Oh, I, 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 I would love to know that. I, I swear know, I know, people are in tune with that. Like, I, I, think, I see Fight Church uh, tw uh, trending. You know? Yeah, I've heard we're definitely the number one commodity on Fight Pass for sure. Like oh, it has exactly. maintained the number one slot on Fight Pass yeah. the entire time. So oh, when I know it's a week that I have Invicta because you guys are on um Friday, usually, right? Or yeah. you know, Thursdays and Fridays, Thursday. I think. Thursday. Oh, Thursdays like chef's kiss. It's like my <laughs> I can my week is gonna be short because I, that's all I need. Um and I know I'm a, a standing here for Invicta, but it's, uh, you know, it's like, it's you and it's TJ and, you know, uh, uh, I would say Julie. Laura and, Laura. and Megan, like, yeah. We, yeah, we, so we rotate the third person on the table. Yeah. It's actually not on the table. So that's very interesting, but yeah, because we're all I'm, separated. Laura Sanko, who's another, you know, been to our class. So I'm sorry, Laura, I just had a space out moment. Um, we have another individual at a round table, Brian. Hello. Hey, everybody. Hello. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself to us? Uh, and we, we, as you know, we're talking about uh, MMA in 2020. Anything in 2020 is <laughs> illuminating. Um, so I'm, I'm Brian Siskind. I am uh, president of the Atticus fan club. <laughs> and uh, and so I just I just show up wherever he is. He's uh, no. So uh, I I co-host the Art Fight podcast with Joe Nolan, and uh, I'm an artist and a, a musician and a filmmaker and a resident weirdo for a lot of other things. I love it. We I we we brought I brought you up with Julie earlier, um, talking about Art Fight, and I can't remember why. <laughs> but but you were talking riveting. About, yes yes. Uh, it'll it'll spring to me. All right, so Brian, I'm going to shift because you know we're talking about MMA um, in 220, and then MMA media we'd like to get into. But what are your thoughts on why the ratings for UFC have done well while other sports are kind of stagnant and are not getting? Uh, I feel like even though um, I feel like everything is sort of not as well translating to this kind of facsimile of a true experience. I think if that makes any sense, um, even there's something so simple about fighting ultimately that, um, I don't know. I just feel like it translates more naturally in this reduced way by, you know, taking the crowd out. It's still what it is. I think that's why you don't have to pump in crowd. And we've talked about a lot of this, um, you know, and I've been watching the NBA finals and, my, my wife was like, this is, what is this black mirror? Like what is going on, you know? Uh, and so it's almost like the more that they try to compensate for what's not happening, they're really just lending credence to what is actually sort of missing. Uh, whereas I think with the UFC and what they're doing and, and just combat sports in general, it's just, it is right here, you know, it's, this is what's happening. So I feel like it's just but the, the medium itself just lends itself better. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a team sport necessarily, even though we kind of know that it is, uh, you know, it's not five on five or, or, you know, that kind of dynamic. And so just the logistics are, are wild, but not as, you know, intense as, you know, what the NFL is fumbling through right now, no pun intended. Um, uh, or, um, you know, the, the NBA, you know, where the, they're having to really sacrifice and, and lock themselves off from society fully. So, um, uh, you know, for somebody like Josh, who's a writer, uh, that's, that's a welcome invitation. But I think that for the NBA, uh, you know, if you were an NBA player, Josh, you'd be having a hard time in the bubble, I think. So, uh, <laughs> I would not do well in the bubble. That's very true. Or yeah. in the NBA for that matter. 
Right. Like I thought that school was canceled. Can't we just stay home? Like, that's what I like. Let's, let's do this. Uh, no, but, uh, but anyway, so I don't know if that, that's an, any kind of insight, but I, I just feel like it just naturally translates better. Yeah. So that begs the question and maybe um, Josh, Atticus or Julie can maybe answer that. Why does MMA translate better? I, mean, I, I think I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Joy. I, I was just going to offer the fact that you can get replacements pretty easily. You can't replace an entire NBA team, but any fighter is willing to step up. But that's a pretty cynical, <laughs> you know, like it's a cynical viewpoint. But it, given, you know, the economics of fighting, it's pretty easy to step up to the plate. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Not that fighting is easy, but opportunities. They'll grab whatever you know a fighter's going to grab whatever opportunity they can to do their work but yeah i want to hear what josh has to say too <laughs> yeah yeah no i think that's good i i was going to say that i think i'm i think i'm trying to understand human beings in 2020 is officially beyond me i don't i don't i don't know if i had any i don't know if i can think of any reason why it would be doing well i don't think i, I didn't realize it was doing well um in comparison to other sports um um I mean, it could, you know, you, you wonder if something like baseball, I don't know, maybe people are used to going to the stadium. Maybe, maybe it's some of these sports mean something more when they have giant crowds there. Even if you're watching from home, maybe they take on a different feel. Maybe there's something communal about baseball. I mean, I know that like, you know, you talk to, if you read a George Will article or whatever, I mean, there's sort of something tied into the American experience or whatever all that nonsense is, but um I don't maybe I, I don't know maybe maybe because fewer people are watching fighting to begin with and watching MMA to begin with it's not so it's not so off-putting or 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 it's not too much to, to to digest that you turn on a fight and there's no crowd there like you know maybe it's it's maybe pe a lot of people don't even you know they have no experience with it at all so it doesn't seem that strange at all whereas trying to watch a basketball game where they're pumping in fake crowd noise is just too disconcerting for someone who's spent years watching basketball games with real crowds and real noise. I, I don't know. I'm, um, I, it seems like all wild guesses, but I guess something's going on. But I think, I think it must have something to do with, with, with that, that people just don't have as, as much experience watching fights as they do these other things. No, it's interesting. And, um, and Atticus, I wanted to see if you have any insight into this because I think we were all worried when other sports started churning and coming back online that MMA would be crowded out. You know, it had its time where it was the only dog in town, right? Um, and I remember they, they, had, they were on UFC or UFC, um, ESPN, what do you call it? Main US, ESPN, is that what we call it? And there was the Elkins fight um, and I can't pronounce the person he was fighting, but he was a zombie of, you know, I mean, he is, always like that but it was and I was just like this is on this is the only sport on ESPN right now and it is just like this might be the introduction to some people of watching sports um because I also wonder it's like maybe there's too much you know like there, where you're so crowded your your closet's so cluttered you don't even want to look at it I don't know Anna because I'm curious what your thoughts I think there are a few aspects. I think a big one is that the UFC has built a brand around itself and it doesn't have like different teams. It's an individual sport, but the brand is the UFC. You have fighters that are like big fighters in the UFC going over to Bellator, like Musasi, like Machida, but you don't have a big following going with them. So I think that's a big part of it. When the UFC is on, you know you're getting a certain product, or at least they express like you're getting a certain product, even if it's bad fights with like someone who's five and zero versus someone who's six and zero that they're just throwing on the undercard. And then I also think that a big aspect is that it's a very individual sport, both like in terms of mentality and in terms of it's not like there's a whole NBA team where they're flying in a plane together and they're training for like eight hours a day together. Or the like, I think we've had like four NFL games delayed this week yeah. because people have gotten COVID. It's not like there's a team of 80 people 
plus coaches, plus their families, plus everything else. It's one person, some sparring partners and some coaches. And like Julie said, people are replaceable too. So everything's like gets slotted in very easily. I think Dana White has shown that he can throw a bunch of fighters nobody's ever heard of who aren't honestly that great onto a card and people are still gonna watch it. So I just think it has a lot going for it that other sports don't. I, I, that's a great kind of summary of all of these points. Uh, so I guess now predictions. Um, we've already kind of talked, will some of these changes stay? And the big one, when, or I have to say sometimes, if we're going to go back to the, what is our normal? Speaking of the future and the normal, did you guys, did anyone read uh, Mark Raimondi's piece today on ESPN? About uh, that, Scott Coker? Was that, that? he um, interviewed Scott Coker or was it? Yeah, Scott? well, it was about Scott, Scott Coker, but more it was about this idea that promoters, and, and I hadn't even thought about this, but one problem they're having as sort of like thinking two or three years out into the future is because smaller MMA fights are not going on, all of the minor leagues, pretty much all the feeder leagues are not, are, haven't been putting on fights for six or eight months now. Yeah. There's, there's a really strong concern about a, uh, a, not a lack of, but like a talent depression in a couple of years, that there's going to be sort of like a, a generation of fighters who should have been evolving during these two or three years and they won't have that opportunity. And one of the things they were saying, and this I was kind of curious to ask Julie about because she's um, an experienced fighter herself is, one of the things that Mark was saying and some of the people he was interviewing were saying, which I thought was fascinating, was that because MMA is still such a young sport, like it kind of evolves very quickly and things change very quickly and people get better very fast and new ideas come in very quickly. And where that comes from is the gym. New languages are discovered in the gym. And the concern for a lot of these people is that the development of and the evolution of the sort of sport itself and what athletes can do in the sport is going to be um, held back. And I was curious just for, from Julie's perspective as someone who spent hours and days and years in, you know, in the gym, if she sort of sees it that way, if, if, if she saw like, you know, she's, you know if, you, if you saw like the language evolving inside the gym like that, and if you worry that, that your beloved sport will sort of be put on pause in terms of its development um oh well, that's a, a lovely way of putting it actually um just kind of the evolution of something and, and those changes happening in the gym um yeah i'm definitely worried about that uh, i'm i'm not worried about mma continuing because already dana's got that cornered by the contender series like just throw in the people who don't have fight experience throw them in there make them stars overnight and it doesn't matter if they do well or not you know just conveyor belt conveyor belt you know that kind of thing it's just like get rid of the the to the expensive ones, we're just going to keep the fight process happening. I, um, I actually like the contender series, but I also worry about those athletes being pushed too far, too too fast. I think that time in the gym is what fighters are going to miss out on because actually that is a concern. I, I do worry about them not getting the sport evolves, of course, as it goes. But what fighters are not getting is they're also not getting the experience of younger fighters around them, older fighters around them. Like, and again, I was in a gym that was really big. It was like kind of when MMA, the big gym phenomenon, was happening. You know, like there were just super gyms kind of coming up. I was, I was, I think on the involved in that or in the cusp of that or you know somewhere within that kind of generation. And um, one of the issues with a giant gym, of course, and one of the, the advantages of training in small pods is that, you know, your secrets don't have to get out, right? Like, you don't have to worry about people coming in taking pictures of you because they're not allowed. Um, but one of the things that you do see in a big gym is you get to see fighters who are not necessarily washed up, but not the greatest. And you get to see their failures and you get to see, you get to learn from that. You get to evolve from that. You get to think about the choices you're going to make. You also get to see the fighters who, you know, who are up and coming and they think they can take on the world and it's annoying as hell sometimes this you know an oh no fighter saying i'm gonna be in the ufc but at the same time you're like well that's a you can 
derive a lot of inspiration from that for your own training. When you have multiple training partners, when you have this kind of um, time that you're training with new people all the time, you do change and you, you get used to being nervous, which is another thing. Like you want to be nervous before sparring practice. You don't want to be uh, it's just sparring. You want to be scared a little bit. You want it because you're going to be scared in a fight. You're going to be nervous in a fight. It's a really good way to, to strengthen that muscle, the, the anxiety muscle and, and work through that. And so, um, I think I, I do have a tendency to depart from the question a little bit, but I do think that the sport could be hurt from, from this, from this departure, from kind of like exposure to new fighters or more time in the gym. And I also think that people are going to be jumping at advantages that maybe they're not prepared for. And I know that's happened forever, but there is something to a local fighter building themselves up and not necessarily handpicking opponents, um, but you know, thinking, okay, I got tapped that last fight. I'm gonna go against another jujitsu person this time and see if I know how to defend that. That strategy never worked for me as a fighter, <laughs> given my record, but you know what I mean? Like there, there's, there's ways to build yourself up, to build your confidence. And um, maybe everybody's going to be super confident because they know they can fight on the contender series as a one and oh fighter or two and oh fighter. I don't know. Um, I, the sport's going to change. It is changing. It's if we continue down this path with kind of um, not having homegrown development, not having local fight shows uh, as often, it is going to be to the detriment of the sport, not having full gyms and, and more exposure to training. It is going to be, to the, and then you're going to have these superstars come out of nowhere. Um, and that's going to be kind of incredible too, because you'll actually get to see the diamonds be polished in front of you. I don't know if that metaphor is working, but, or if I'm kind of communicating what I'm trying to say, but it's going to change and it's going to be noticeable. It already is noticeable. Um, I don't know what the next step, I don't know what the right thing to do from there is. That's where I, you know, I have no theories beyond that, except that, yeah, we're gonna see a big change if we haven't already started seeing it. it, it you bring up so many great points, Julie. Uh, and, um, and Josh, I also appreciate that you're talking about the loss of the gym culture. And that's not just about training. It's about the optics of seeing and also the relationships you're building, um, the coaching and coaching is not just physical. You know, there's that mental aspect. Um, and you brought up something earlier, uh, Julia, that's been hanging in my head about how most fighters have adversity of some sort and we have COVID. So it is gonna be interesting how that's gonna be part of a fighter's, um, you know, backstory, you know, even if they're a current fighter or if they're 10 and, or, you know, when they were, they couldn't train in their peewee karate league for a while, or just, you know, saw, you know, that they couldn't go to school for a while. And so it, it is interesting to see how that is going, because I'm also thinking with the limitation of, you know, being able to interact in team sports, how that's going to affect just, you know, interest in sports as a, as an athlete, or could we have the, you guys know, I say this a lot the roaring 2020s, where we are in the gym 24 hours a day. Like, um, Josh, wasn't it your friend Stefan went to one of those like gyms that was a, that was also a party? Like, oh, yeah, party? yeah, it was, it was, there was a bar and there was so really exciting. just nothing but beautiful people. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're going to be, could perhaps we have to remember because you know, with the Spanish flu or the, or the epidemic of 1918, um, you know, it's not really talked about that that was really why we had the Roaring 2020s. We had, you know, World War One that was over and, you know, we were going through prohibition. But I do think that there's something about this idea that they survived something and there's that idea. So, and we are adaptable. So I wonder, like Julie, you're saying, like what, knowing that we have these deficits, Will there be like, will we have to train in different ways or, you know, aspects like that? Um, oh, yeah. yeah, no, I was like, I mean, I, I think absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting is that fighters and adversity, like every fighter, I think hold, they, they can come across or, or paint themselves as positive and as loving and, also, and so many people are in this sport, but every fighter has a chip on their shoulder. Like, 
you, you can be in the cage and, and be an extraordinary athlete and believe in yourself and love the people around you, but you're not locking yourself up in the cage with another person um, because it's lovemaking. You know, you're, you're doing it because it's something like it may, you, whether you view it as art or you view it as, you know, just fighting and hatred or whatever it is, or this is a science, however you view it, you're going into combat of a sort. So you're, you're looking to inflict harm. And so that means, you know, if you're wanting to inflict harm on somebody, there's something in you that, that has that desire. And, and I don't know, there's kind of a mentality of being targeted or, or, or feeling not like a victim necessarily, but just feeling like you're against the world. And that's, that is what makes fighting so interesting because it's a lone sport, but it's not a lone sport. I think of the Rocky movies, the old ones and like, you know, Rocky with all the crowds and everything. And then Rocky four, he's training alone. Like, or, you know, or he's just got his trainer, um, Apollo Creed's trainer, I forget the guy's name, I'm sorry. And they're, you know, in the cabin in the woods and stuff like that. And that's, I think we're in our Rocky four period basically as, as you know, as a sport. Um, that's but, not good. No. <laughs> we don't, we don't want, humanity does, does not want to be in its Rocky Four period. <laughs> Ted, Ted Kaczynski is getting his training in really well right now. <laughs> With kind of that, the, the lone wolf mentality uh, works really well for fighters because that is kind of this, however popular you are, however you want people to cheer for you and everything like that, you also think everybody's against you to a certain extent. Like you have to. Otherwise you would be I don't know. I can't even think of what you would be doing besides that. Probably being a fantastic track athlete or, you know what I mean? Like there's something that draws us to combat. And I, I'm not a psychologist. I'm probably spouting, it's not bro science since I'm saying it. So cis science, I guess, I don't know, but like it's, but there is something about that it's not a victimization exactly, but it's, it's this kind of like, my back's against the wall, I gotta go, that every fighter has. Um, and that really drives so many fighters. Yeah. And this could actually be a really great time for the ones who have that the most. Yeah. I have a question, oh. uh, Julie, um, on, this on this line. Uh, you know, looking back on your career, do you have, um, I mean, obviously training methods and a lot of things have evolved and there's a lot of sort of kind of barbaric things that have proven to not be really helpful uh, have been sort of illuminated over time or whatever, you know, there's all these different training methods that maybe people have realized are not the, the brightest or maybe don't take so much contact or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I'm wondering if in this sort of gap of sort of pedagogy or whatever's happening right now, um, if you feel like on the flip side that there might be this opportunity, uh, because in every other realm, I mean, everybody's you know, everybody's cleaning out their closet finally or organizing or, you know, reassessing everything. So I guess I'm just curious about um, if you see on the flip side of that, that maybe even though they're, uh, you know, to Ramundi's point and everything else, obviously there's a logistical promotional sort of problem potentially, but ultimately do you see that there might be also a, a yield of some improved um, techniques or maybe it's a whole generation of fighters that have been able to actually take time off to really heal up and in the MMA span of time I mean people get uh, you know suspensions that are maybe longer than hopefully what all this is so uh, you know I guess I'm just wondering if you see like there's, there's a flip side where it's like you know what some of this some of this excess of training and some of the maybe more misguided aspects of it are actually now going to be perhaps maybe more honed in or maybe some some things could be better yeah, no, I, I I agree with you. I think there's going to be some, uh, how do I explain this? We're going to see the geniuses rise, um, definitely, right? The people who can adapt even more, the people who are very, very good at it, they're going to rise to the top. We're going to see that. Um, I don't necessarily see that as being any kind of outlier or any for those people. I think we're also going to see a lot of people fall back and, and, and you know, fighters fall back and, you know, just not know how to train themselves because they don't have access to things. But again, there are so many videos the, the internet always negates any theory I have, <laughs> like, whether it's a logical negation or not. Like, there's, there's, and people have so much better access to things besides bodies to train. And that actually could be really great for brain health in the sport, if nothing else. Yeah. So Brian, are you saying that like uh, punching the meat carcass is in Rocky? Is that one of those outdated methods? Cause I thought everyone has a meat. Yeah. That's only worthwhile if you're filming it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, okay, I have a couple, two more questions. Do we have time for that? Um, and I don't know which one. Okay, first one, I guess this will be kind of just quick. When do you see live MMA events occurring? I think it's going to be a long time. I don't see us. I don't. I don't see anything happening. People going back to offices in great numbers, live sporting. I think. I, I think you know that it's. It, there's been such a, a, a spitting in the face of, of science and facts and and logic and 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 thinking in this country in response to this disease that it's. I, I can't. I don't know how much it set us back. Time. What the timeline. Uh, has been has, has been set back but i just i don't think we're anywhere close to it because you know you get i mean the, I, I don't it seems like we're not even going to get an experimental vaccine until sometime next year and then even if we do how many people get it how do you get it to people and then how many people either on the left because we don't trust donald trump and his fda and his cdc to actually tell us what the facts are and how many people on the right because people on the right are anti-science and insane are not going to take this vaccine. So I can only, I can only say for myself, I'm not going anywhere near a sport, a live sporting event where there's a crowd of people. I, I can't even imagine when that would be like, I, I mean, I know, I'm sure we've all had this experience. I know I've had my friends and I have talked about it, Like you watch a movie now that was made five years ago, 10 years ago, and you see people standing too close or you see people like, you know, in a crowd of people and your instinct is to be like, what the fuck are they doing? Why, what, that's, that's madness. And I don't know, it's gonna take a while to recover from that mentality. If you dropped a vaccine on us today, I still think it's gonna be a while. I just, I just don't see it. No. There's nothing to be afraid of, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Except everything. Julie, what about Invicta? Have you guys talked about this? Um, I haven't been privy to those conversations if, if they've taken place. Um, but I will say, I honestly think Josh is optimistic in that assessment. I think that there's going to be live events, but they're going to be live events with jacked up ticket prices that the only very, very wealthy insider good friends um, are like those, I don't know, those black tie underground fighting, uh, the I don't, I remember these happening. I never went to one, but you know, you have to pay thousand dollars a plate to watch fights happen. And I think that's the model that's going to be adopted first um, before. It's like eyes punched shut. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, I, actually from what I remember of those events, there, there was a lot of nudity at them too, but um, <laughs> never got to fight for one, darn. Um, but <laughs> the, um, the, I think that, yeah, I'm pretty cynical when it comes to, I think they're going to find a way to make money off of big donors um, at first. Not Invicta, because I think we're angels and wonderful. Um, and also Shannon is highly moral. Um, and, she, you know, but I think that, you know, some of the big shows, they're already going to do their, you know, the select group of people that are going to watch. And um, yeah, that could really, really go poorly. Yeah. No, because they already have VIP kind of experiences that they give to people. Um, and so I also think like Dana White, like to, to have people come, I see it also as more of a problem. And this goes into my last question is we know Dana White's, he doesn't try and hide his political leaning. <laughs> uh, he was at the RNC and spoke and um, you know, there is a segment, we were talking about this, there's definitely a culture war in MMA where people are very vocal and we have, and I was asking Julie earlier about this, about how come fighting maybe translates or it gives this space for these conservative and sometimes even conspiracy kind of things. And is it possibly the anti-authoritative rebel aspect of the sport? that leads to it. Um, but what do we think about the politics um, involved here? And how has that, what has that kind of done with MMA in terms of having Dana White so vocal and other individuals so vocal? I sort of want to hear what everybody else has to say because I could go on for an hour. So <laughs> I don't want to hear other people for it. At least to the end, because like this could just. <laughs> yeah. 
I didn't even bring up like social media and. <laughs> I feel like it's it's par for the course. I don't think anybody remotely close to MMA or a fan is deeply surprised. Probably I would fifty percent, if not more, are happy about it. And you know, the rest of us, we're already having to look past. You know, Josh, we've talked about this a lot. You know, and uh, you've detailed your quest with this very well. But you know, the 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 amount of like sort of self loathing and uh, weird doubt that you have to get through to really reconcile with the fact that you want to watch violence on a weekly basis uh, and really get into it. Um, you know, we've, we've all from various angles uh, had to approach that in some way. So I kind of just think it's, it's sort of a non, a non issue or not surprising or in a weird way, it kind of, it kind of makes you feel like you're at home because, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know, like when you're a teenager, you know, and, and, and you, you want to have something immediately external to you that seems to have some sort of power in your life that you can decry or, or, you know, talk about or complain about. So I don't know, it just feels like, I don't know, not a big deal. It's, it, it's, it's, um, Hey, you know, it's America, first of all, so everybody can believe what they want. Uh, even if it's absolute, um, lunacy or, or whatever. Um, and you know, the political stuff, I mean, I think it's actually, uh, and I wish Joe was here because he could really speak to this more eloquently than I could. But I think there's also a quick thing to, to think about politics when really it's a it's a, this is a class uh, situation, I think, more more than anything. So without getting into like poli sci uh, course offerings here, I mean, I just I feel personally like whatever, man, just, you know, put on these mediocre fights that Atticus likes to critique and and let's just let's just get on with it. So I, I try not to, I mean, we all have to have this sort of hardened, just to exist in the past two weeks, you have to somehow do a mind trick on yourself that we're fine, right? It, this is, it, we'll be fine. So, uh, or that makes sense or, or whatever, you know, you're trying to justify just about every incredulous, bizarre, you know, uh, thing that's going on. So Dana White, you know, posturing, for, you know, at the RNC or whatever, like, eh, you know. Yeah. Ultimately, too, it's like there is this thing called karma and, you know, like the, the causes that you support and the energy that you put out into the universe will uh, be returned to you in, in some way. And it doesn't mean I'm wishing harm on anybody. Um, well, I mean, there's no, 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 I'm not wishing harm on anybody. But, uh, you know, we all have to live with each other, I guess. And if he happens to be like a really effective promoter that's putting on fights that, uh, pacify my existential dread uh, once a week, then that's fine. No, um, and I, that's such a great points. And like, I, I hope that I'm usually like that, Brian, but there are weaker moments where I'll be honest, like I'll have people in my family who are a different political affiliation that will troll me saying, Dana White, did you see he's at RNC? And I'm just like, hmm you know, and I just put the phone away, um, you know, when those things happen, because I, you worry that some people might associate as that we are all just clear MMA nerds here that I, you know, that that association kind of hangs with it. I don't know. Um, I'd love to know, Andy, Josh, you wrote an article for the Washington Post on this very subject. Well, as to that point, I think that what Brian was saying is absolutely true, that I think that ship has sailed in terms of people we know and people in our lives having bad associations with MMA and not being able to understand why we would be associated with it. Like I like like long before Dana White was speaking at the RNC or Trump was president or Colby Covington existed, we've been having to rationalize to people why we like this completely, you know, this this inexcusable thing. So I think we're all pretty prepared for that. Um, um, so yeah, like I, you know, like n none of my friends will bring up the Dana White at the RNC thing. It's more sort of a, um, uh, a source of amusement, I think, you know, the only thing that bothers me. And I think, you know, in general, I think I, I like what Brian was saying about like, when you sort of look at what Dana White gives you versus what he takes away from you, like he does, he's offering me something that I need in my life. He is, he is providing me something I need in my life. Someone like Colby Covington someone who's like intentionally stirs those pots and intentionally pokes those 
those you know hornets nests and 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 might be motivating the worst kinds of people in this country to do the worst kinds of things that for me is unforgivable and when you've got a roster of 600 people i'm totally fine with him being thrown off the roster like one fighter being gone is is you know that's not going to end mma um I mean, that's really the only thing that concerns me. I, I wish that, that Dana White wouldn't get it, but I, I see Dana White more as an opportunist and a mercenary than I do an ideologue. You know, I think he just, I, wh whatever deals get struck with him, he speaks at the RNC and, and some sort of tax break comes his way or whatever. It's, it's, it seems entirely mercenary to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess there's just so much compromise with oneself that you make to be a fan of combat sports to begin with, that I'm generally comfortable with, or at least tolerant of most of it. Yeah. No, Josh, um, as you remember, Julie was actually, you were complimenting Dana White on setting up all protocols and making them better. And I will not compliment Dana White for that, but, but, but. but like, I have to say, if, if Dana White were the person who was patrolling um, and setting up security, and other safety precautions for the Rose Garden, we would not, you know, and I guess what I'm saying is that Dana White, as much as he talks, he is following experts. I mean, would you be surprised at all with this president if the promoter of a, a cage fighting uh, organization was put in charge of the coming out party for a Supreme Court nominee? I mean, it would, would, at this point, there would be no surprise at all. You know what? I mean, because, you know, Dana could call him and look, look, I've had, you know, 30 events and I've never had one instance or something, you know. That's true. <laughs> I would I mean, like to insert something really quick. Dana doesn't wear a mask. So perhaps in complimenting him, I mean the people around him. I think, yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I may have misspoken. Yeah. I can take back my complimentary thing because he doesn't <laughs> wear a mask. So, yes. It's good to have you, it's good to have you back. Sending it's my good. compliments. It's good to have you back, Julie. <laughs> what is what is this this masculinity thing, though? Right? Like, what is that? What is the stuff of that? Because I, I, you know, I understand in a sense sort of what toxic masculinity is as a term, but it seems like there's a very special mm, mm -hmm. kind of this, right? Like, where it's it's a it's another level of like it's a fermented bravado or something. Like, what, what bravado? That sounds like a dish I should get at a Korean barbecue. I, it's, it's the thing in the jar in the back that you're like, on, on, only the locals eat that and you shouldn't, you yeah. know? But no, I mean, it's, it's uh, I don't know, I just find it curious, right? And I know that we have some, some good insight on this panel here, but I guess I'm, this is part of what I've been churning, right? Is, is the, the psychology behind all this and how is it? It's almost like if we can even understand vaguely Dana White, then perhaps we can understand the larger uh, influence of this kind of uh, thing. But maybe Julie, you have some insight to, to this particular flavor of, of weird masculinity. I have theories. Um, <laughs> and I think it's that there's a lot of men who don't want their toys taken away and they pitch a fit when they're called out on it. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily just men. I think it's a segment of the population or, but I think that it, is strongly, it's most represented in white men of a certain age. Good point. Freak the F out if, you know, anything. I mean, it's like, you you know, this person's taking your toys away. This person's doing this. They're coming after you. The suburbs will die. You know, it, it, all of these threats, all these threats, trying to make somebody feel unsafe because they inherently feel unsafe. Dana White's scared. Donald Trump is scared. They are terrified. Any fighter who walks into the cage and isn't scared, that they're BSing you. And so it, fighting in all of its beauty and art that I absolutely adore and evolution is, it is just, it is fighting. And you fight when you're scared. And you may not feel scared afterwards or something may click in you, but that's, it's fight or flight. You're in that moment. I think that we're, and again, I don't have any science backing this up whatsoever. So I'm sure I'll be, you know, skewered for it, but there's this, it's what all these proud boys and all of these groups and these QAnon, all these theories, everything's developed to prey on that sense of fear. And so, or to create and then make money off that sense of fear, be, make money off it, you know, uh, we'll train you how to fight better. We'll train you how to do this and that against, you know, the, the strangers who are coming into your neighborhood. And, oh my gosh, there's bands of people coming to America, um, caravans and all this. It, it, they want you to be afraid because they're terrified. 
And so if you make the guy next to you more scared, he'll be on your side or he'll look to you and you'll feel more like a man. Um, that's my theory. And I've yet to have it disproven. Um, yeah. I think men are terrified because we have changed and, and, and people are being called on things and they start screaming. Um, well, that's, oh God, what are all the terms for? It's just like, oh, anything that changes your worldview is gonna make you not the smartest person in the room for a while. It's gonna make you not the toughest person in the room for a while. And it's hard to be humble when you're actually scared. It's hard to be voluntarily humble. And, you know, especially there's, I mean, I'm not trying to, go anti-man here because I think that one of the things is that men are terrified because there's so much pressure placed on yeah. them to be and act a certain way. And the reason I have these insights is from fighting, from having to be and act a certain way to be the right kind of fighter, right? When people told me I fought like a man, I thought that was a compliment because that was somehow, the, there's something in all of that that was like this, this huge social pressure, physical pressure, everything like that. And I mean, you know, for a white middle-aged man in America, you're supposed to have a certain amount of money. You're supposed to have this kind of status. You're supposed to have this car. You're supposed to have this, this, this. And it's not there. That's the lie of, of an agenda that's been working forever. And I, I don't speak to the black male experience. Well, I shouldn't speak for the male experience except for the experiences that I've had with white males in my life. I don't speak to the black male experience because that's not the culture or, or the experience that I've had the most interaction with and I but I think there's pressure on men everywhere to act and have this and have that and this and that you know I think there's it's something in capitalism there but not just capitalism it's that's what they're scared men are scared um and their the bravado is their way of trying to make you scared too I don't buy it <laughs> No, I, uh, that is interesting, even though the bravado is, I don't need a mask. And I, get, I think that, Brian, while you're bringing up this fermented uh, masculinity uh, or fermented bravado, um, is that women don't have to have that performative aspect. Like a woman can still go, I think, and wear a mask and not be seen as less strong, um, whereas a male. Although if I... If I, I've watched some rallies and it does look like it's equal gendered um, in terms of people not wearing masks. But uh, I do think that's interesting. And um, I mean, like going into theory, capitalism helps, it helps out when white males or males are in the driving seat, right? There's no competition, you know, you have childcare, you know, I'm not saying that, but this is kind of, you look at the dynamic about why America was great. A lot of it happens to be that aspect of that era when a white man didn't have that competition um, with other things. And I don't mean to say white men, but I kind of do. And I think that's interesting that we're playing this out now, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, it's interesting too that there's like, a so for instance, I, I, even just today, I have a friend calling me from Australia, like what in the hell is actually going on? Because people over here are just kind of laughing about it. And, and it's just a soap opera that they're watching, but they don't feel any attachment to. And, and uh, you know, that yeah. my, my friend, you know, he spent a lot of time here over the last couple of years and just kind of got back there. So he's sort of like trying to tell people like, no, no, this is, like people actually, this is real, like, and this is, you know, what's really going on. Uh, this is not just some sort of weird isolated theater that the media is uh, exaggerating. Well, in some cases, but, uh, but you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, I, I wonder like, since MMA is so international, you know, if like how that works in terms of uh, if there are different, you know, sort of, I feel like that the, the international nature of it sort of doesn't really matter in terms of perspectives on what's going on because there's just people want a spot. Like it doesn't matter about like, I'm going to come from anywhere, from any mentality, from any sensibility to just get in here and it doesn't matter. But I guess I was just curious about like, if there's any reflections in the MMA sphere that have happened uh, to sort of reveal themselves as a, a broader international perspective on what is uniquely at this stage, an American uh, sort of problem that's happening right now, even though it's a worldwide problem, is uniquely American. I would say, 
I, yes. I mean, we have this, you know, um, I hate to use the word selfish, but we do have this idea um, where you kind of think about yourself and, and maybe that was that rugged individualism, right? That we would go off, you know, manifest destiny, take what's yours. Uh, but the sense, um, and I talked about this with Julie, is the sense of, you know, kind of communal sacrifice is just like, you know, and, and we've done this in the past. We've had civil wars and world wars where it was expected that your son would go off and fight for the country and take off a year of their life and, and do these things. And now the expectation, like, cause I heard this great um, scientist um, talking a, a podcast and I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he was talking about how if we really locked down for six to eight weeks, this could be done. And it's like amazing just to think if we just all came together and did it and then you could go to your football games and your things because we would have, you know, can do it, but we can't sacrifice that together. Yeah. Well, just to, to add on to my, my Australian friend, he, he was, uh, he called me this morning. So he was coming home from the bar and he had been hanging out with, uh, a, a, he's in this remote region. He's an artist and he's painting a giant, uh, dam. It's this huge project, this crazy, uh, cultural, thing but anyway so part of what he's doing is he kind of goes and assimilates to the culture he's been in america for the last year and a half working he gets over there he's like you don't understand it's there's nothing here like i we do whatever we want we're fine because everybody understands how it works and there's no problem here like he quarantined for two weeks government mandated and he's in and then he's fine and so he's out at a bar crowded bars with uh old coal miners and and having a good old time and i'm just like Oh, like people were in an alternate universe. Uh, and it's so, it is, it's very frustrating. So I don't know. I hope that, um, I hope that, uh, time wearing on, maybe people will be like, well, I guess we've tried everything else. Maybe we should actually just try the only thing that is the thing to do. And then maybe that'll, that'll work. Uh, but you know, I want to fold this back into MMA per your panel here, but I, I haven't really, I kind of got lost unmoored from that, but I just wanted to. Oh, I want to hear about the coal miners in the bar. You're right. I, <laughs> well, I would, if I could just be myself there, I would go right now. I'm that I've got FOMO for that. That's what we're talking about. And guess about. what? You're not welcome. And neither <laughs> am I. No one, no Americans are, are there. It's like, no, nah, we're good. Thanks. I mean, you know, things have fallen off in this country when we've got FOMO for the lives of Australian coal miners. <laughs> that, Things have really gone downhill. We are, people. Uh, and, you know, even just to bring it back, and I, I'd love to get Atticus's sense on this, um, but to bring it back into MMA, I do think we should look at the people around Dana White that he has hired to make sure. I mean, that caveat. Because what it is, is basically what we're talking about. Sacrifice, quarantine. I mean, look at what they did for... Fight Island, you had to quarantine at the launch pad or wherever you were going, uh, Vegas or Sao Paulo, and then you get on a plane and then you get tested again and again. I mean, and look, it's been successful. So it is, when you look at it, it's like, why aren't we seeing? <laughs> because the Rose Garden is the opposite of the of Fight Island. Um, Atticus, please share your thoughts. Just kind of to bring it back to like politics and MMA and like what even is the relationship there. I don't think a lot of people realize like the degree to which Trump is the norm in MMA, especially in the UFC. Like Kamaru Usman supports Donald Trump. His parents are Nigerian immigrants. He came, he's a Nigerian immigrant. He fully supports Donald Trump, has gone to rallies. Henry Cejudo, both of his parents are undocumented immigrants. He supports Donald Trump. Um, Didn't Justin Gaethje go to a rally? Justin Gaethje went there with Covington, like, and Ali Abdulaziz. Masvidal. Um, I think, yeah. Then there's, like, so the support, I think Damian Maya is the only Brazilian fighter I know who does not actively support Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil. 
every single Russian MMA fighter is going to have gone through like Rustam Katarov, who was in the news for like executing gay people en masse like six years ago. Every single Russian MMA fighter is going to have trained at a facility for him or something like that. Peter Yan has, Habib has. So I think the bar for MMA isn't like keeping it from descending it into the right. It's like keeping it from literal fascism and trying to create a barrier between those two. And I don't think it's looking good necessarily. Um, Kareem Zidane, who writes for Bloody Elbow, I assume almost everyone's familiar with him. Shout out to, to yeah. his work. He's yeah. incredible. Yeah. But he like wrote a list of MMA fighters who like support conspiracy theories. And like Jared Cannonier, Tito Ortiz, Jorge Masvidal, Jorge Masvidal, who's doing like the March Against Socialism, which is gonna end in American Top Team, the biggest MMA gym in the country. Um, like all of these fighters believe in and spread like QAnon conspiracy theories. Um, just recently, there was a gym in Rochester, New York. I think it was called like Wolf Brigade that has ties to Operation Werewolf, which is a neo-Nazi movement in the Northeast. And they like have driven to Portland to beat up people before. Um, the UFC and UFC PI actually like announced a partnership with them, like with them as a partner gym. So all of this, and then like you have Andrea Lee, who's ex, which there's a lot in that situation that I'm not gonna unpack here, but her ex was like a neo-Nazi, is still, well, her ex is a neo-Nazi when she was, she was with him while she was in the UFC. Um, and then you have like Spark Carlisle, who was on one UFC show, and I think they actually did cut him after this, just posting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Like I could go on, but it's just like, yeah. there needs to be a barrier there. The barrier like can't be with Trump anymore because everyone supports Trump, but like there does need to be a barrier there. And I think there needs to be a big fan pushback against that. Wow. I have to say my student, you brought, your sources and evidence with that argument, which was going against kind of the more, I just tolerate it, but wow, I, you know, and we've talked about these, but that wasn't coming to mind. So uh, well done, I guess. And you definitely give us note that we can think of like wearing a mask and these other things, but we're talking about fascism. We're talking about creating armies in Chetnya through, you, through, through gyms um, that are supported and, and go into the UFC. So, um, you know, that's Kadyrov, I guess. Uh, wow. Well, I think we have a lot to work on. And, and um, Julie is actually going to come back to the writing fight. You are always welcome, always. And I'm, I'm going to keep asking, too. Uh, on October 28th, so please write that down. We're gonna talk about social media. And I think this is an interesting place to do it, um, especially in light of the, uh, we, we know we've talked about our uh, uh, Brian, Josh and Atticus, Esther Lynn. And um, you know, the fact that we have lost her, that was a 2020 loss um, of MMA, huge. I mean, she- For the unknowing, she's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I'm such a knee deep in, in um, my MMA community. Okay, she <laughs> is alive and well, but um, she has left her job at MMA fighting as uh, a uh, combat sports photographer. And so it just it saddens me because she's so great at it to think that um, 2020 has no pictures outside of February or whenever she was at things. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> But anyway, why I bring her up is that one of the reasons she said she was leaving was the toxic um, atmosphere of social media in, with them, within MMA. And I think Julie has encountered it. You had some experience <laughs> with this. Uh, and we're going to dial into that, um, you know, because social media is something people talk about that MMA was one of the earliest sports to embrace it. And you know, fighters were able to connect to their fans and public 
they didn't need their promoter. And, but how has, what are the negative effects of social media as well? So. Thank you guys so much. Um, Julie, everyone, please watch your commentary and Invicta, is there, and then can you give your Twitter and all those other? Um, I'm at Jules K underscore fighter, mostly on Twitter. I, I might lock my account so I can get a job, but we'll see. <laughs> I can't bring myself to delete it, but I might lock it for a while. So employers actually get me a chance. It seems to be working against me, but yeah, um, at Jules K underscore fighter is my Twitter and Instagram. And uh, yeah, the next Invicta show, oh my gosh, it, November, I'm, it's the 20th or the 21st. I'm so sorry that I'm not getting this off the top of my head. Cause I'll look it up in my, um, but yeah, we, uh, November 20th, goodness, okay. <laughs> like it's another Friday show. So yeah, November 20th is the next Invict FC show. You know, you can mute me if you don't want to hear me talk, but watch the fighters because oh. it's so good and it's two title fights. It's going to be great, so yeah. No, you want to hear Julie. Uh, she's so great and giving you contacts and, um, you know, all those little insights. It's poetry. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and, and, um, hopefully the gender, I remember you had the generator issue, the first one. You guys seem to have gotten all that. I love that. I was like, we are really in fight church. Uh, <laughs> okay, Atticus, where can people find you? I am, I am on Twitter at Atticus C. Crow. Um, and then I'm in Washington, D.C. and sometimes Oregon. So if I see you on the street, Prop very weird, but. <laughs> and the biggest question, I think we've all been waiting, did your desk arrive or are you still on the ironing board? I am still on the ironing board, oh my but Lord. I am seeing my roommate Friday. We are going for a hike. My roommate from last year, Friday, and he has a car and a house, not an apartment. So I should have a desk very soon. I hope so, because I feel like if we're to November and you don't have that desk, yeah. I'm gonna have, we have to do something. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And Brian. Uh, you can find me at those drones on the Twitters uh, or the Instagrams. And um, otherwise I'm just, you know, lurking and being angry, but not saying as much as I feel like saying, because uh, I'm trying to not put myself in the position that Julie is finding herself in now. <laughs> but by the way, Julie, for you, like be yourself, whoever, whoever is going to uh, hire you for anything uh, should uh, only be emboldened and, and happy about uh, your, 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 your principled stances and, and your, your being vocal. So don't, don't shy away from that. Or maybe just put like a pinned tweet at the top. It's just like a disclaimer. Like they don't have to scroll, you know, you told them, but, uh, but anyway, so yeah, you can find me at those drones. Definitely. No, and I, uh, before we get scratched, uh, like Julie, what I really would miss is that you bring in the discourse of all of these other like intellectual arguments into the dumpster fire. And I really need that. So just add that. Josh, are you, you're, are you off the social media? I'm off everything but Twitter. Yeah. And Twitter, it's very, 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 very rare that I get on, but I'm off. I'm, I'm free of Facebook and I'm free of Instagram at last. What does it feel like? It's fantastic. I've been off for a couple months now and, and it, I can definitely feel the difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a giant weight off my shoulders. The anxiety, the anxiety level is down to like pure panic now, but, but it's, not, it's not above that. Oh, yes, exactly. Well, we have a book to promote as well Josh, i'm promoting yeah. i'm promoting josh's book for him uh because he's, oh, right. he's not on social media so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I i have number 12 of 50 of the fine art of violence by chris reaney and josh rosenblatt right there boom uh i was wondering why you didn't uh you know respond to my shout out on twitter josh i was just trying to oh. i wasn't trying to pollute your mind or you know anything i was just trying to uh give you some props for some great work, but this is really awesome, man. It looks great. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and I, I can't wait for the second one. Uh, you guys did a great job. Thanks, man. Yeah. 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 To, many shout outs to Chris Reaney for putting that together. And Chris Reaney who writes at, um, uh, elbows, bloody elbows. Yes. Um, he has like a column or, or a cartoon. Uh, 
so a good friend of Chris Rini. And so the volume two, I, that is great to hear. I didn't even know that. Oh, he's yeah. going to do it. He's going to do it every year, I think. All right. He's bringing in. He's bringing in the dream team of writers for this volume two, isn't he, Josh? Yeah, who's he getting? Mindenhall and uh, who, who, who else is he getting? He just he he, he rattled off a lot. So you're, you're not going to have to do yeah. as much work, I guess. Are you just going? You going to sort of editorial? Like, are you going to sort of call it together, or how are you? How's that going to work? I don't want to. I don't know. I, that was that was news to me when he when, oh. when he when he dropped those names on the show. I, I was like, you know, I, I thought I was doing it by myself again, but. Uh. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was totally oh, news to me. It's probably a good time to not be on social media then, so you don't have to have like a weird beef with Chris. And then, like, I thought that I was the only writer on this thing, and then yeah, now here we are, bro. I, I got to share a space on the bottom of that book cover now. Yeah, it's, but I've got this forever, man. Your and your font is as big as his, right? Look at that. I know. I love that. Yeah, got the it big looks, font. It looks like those books, you know, a library book. You know, where they've taken like, you know, and, and made a leather or like a first edition, I guess. Yeah. So, um, I love it, man. I love that he went with the, um, he went with the real catcher in the rye kind of a vibe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's almost a book I should hide from my parents, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, um, it's been so great talking with you, Fight Nerds. Uh, and um, I love that we talk about like uh, our friends' books on, um, you know what, what? What's the title again? The art of violence. The fine art of violence, fine volume art. one. Ah, uh, and um, so please come back. I uh, thank you, Julie. It was so great catching up. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Yeah, I'm I'm around yeah. till I get a job. I'm <laughs> I'll uh, talk about fights as much as you want. It, uh, you guys, really, it really helps coming together. And um, I know that there are more of me that I'm not alone in my thoughts. And, uh, and we overthink together. There you go. Have a great night. Yeah. Thanks, and everybody. In touch. Bye. Thanks, Nancy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.